and I just couldn't get it out of my head. It took, you know, years and years of reading and reading and reading. I just, it just never comfortably sat in my head. And so there was always this niggling doubt. And it always hit me when someone asked me a question, you know, and the biggest question that always got me was they said, yeah, but if your canine tips were, why would you give them canine guidance again? Hello, Producer Auntie. I'm Jazz Galati, and welcome to episode 66 of the Petrusa Dental Podcast. Are you feeling a little bit less stressed after that phenomenal episode with Manrina Rodriguez, which was episode 65, which is all about how we can be more mindful in dentistry. So thank you again, Manuela, for that. This episode, I had to just squeeze in occlusion one more time before we came to the end of March, because April, is straight pearl okay it doesn't quite have the same ring to it as splint timber but you know give me some props here straight pearl is not bad so it's all about orthodontics next month we're going to talk about retention protocols the do's and don'ts of aligners elastic in aligner therapy and um, the whole gdp versus specialist debate so i have a gdp and a specialist on so you get both perspectives so that's all coming in a few weeks very soon before we dive into the meat and potatoes of the main episode, just wanted to share some news with you guys, some really cool news. The Splint course enrollment, which some of you, many of you took part in, uh, has ended. And oh my God, it was phenomenal. I'm so pumped to have delegates from all over the world, from Taiwan, Singapore, UAE, India, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. Uh, it's great to have a real community of people who just want to learn about splints. And already we've got this secret Facebook group and everyone's posting cases. And uh, it's a really special group that's really engaged. And I just want to share with you uh, the feedback I got from the very first delegate who finished Splint Course. His name is Nasir Javed, and this is what Nasir had to say about the Splint Course. What a brilliantly put together online course. This course is bursting with educational gems, patient videos, detailed explanations, and an easy to follow and digest format. You can tell a lot of thought has gone into preparing and delivering this course, and its direct relevance to everyday practice makes it most engaging. One of the most value for money courses I've ever done. Thanks, Jazz. Well, that is just spectacular from my first delegate who's finished it. What can I say? I am just absolutely made up after that feedback. Nasir, thanks for being the first delegate to finish. And since now I'm recording this, uh, five people have finished the Splint course entirely and the feedback is just great. I'm gonna share it with you in the future again, but I just wanna get to the main bit of the episode. Before I do, the other bits of news I have for you is that I have had two podcast features, which I think I'm pretty proud of and I wanna share them with you. One is on Dr. James Martin's podcast podcast, which is uh, on money. It's Dentist Who Invest podcast. And if you remember many episodes ago, I had James on my podcast. Uh, and then on the back of that, he made his own podcast, Dentist Who Invest, and it's fantastic. Uh, it delivers a lot of great value. Uh, and I did my bit on the podcast about how as dentists, we should be start thinking about uh, other ways, other ways to sort of spread our risk. Because I, I, I sort of say that in our profession, the most stressful thing is that it just takes one issue, one complaint, one GDC issue or your regular regulatory body issue wherever you are in the world and that's your livelihood gone right so how can we diversify um, our financial strategies to make sure that we are bulletproof so that's what we discuss in fact I'm just gonna play a little snippet from that podcast the point of it is that you can you're supposed to be financially free at some stage and maybe having a tangible point is very 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 helpful so another another good message there do you think you'll continue to do dentistry jazz when you reach that point Yes, absolutely. Because, 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 uh, you know, I feel as though I want to be able to do that. And I think everyone should, aim, I think every dentist should aim for this, right? If you can make yourself in a financial position that you do dentistry because you want to and not because you need to, wow. I mean, can you just imagine that? That you can go into work and you want to do this dentistry uh, and the, the, the awkward patient that you have in front of you who doesn't excite you, you can just be like, you know, I'm not so interested. You, know, you don't have to take that treatment plan on, whatever. That's, that's the holy grail, man. It is, it is, I love it, my friend. As well as Dentists Who Invest, I was also on the Dental Leaders podcast, one of my favorite dental podcasts. Uh, this is with Payman Langrudi and Prav Solanke. Uh, and I'm gonna play a, a short and sweet little snippet from the Dental Leaders podcast, which I think you should totally listen to. It's a great podcast. So although I didn't have enough knowledge to teach, I was always thinking, how can I become a better educator? So once I've amassed enough knowledge, once I've had enough failures, once I've really given it my all, and I have something valuable to share, 
then I'll be ready. So I was, I was gearing myself up to it for many years. I was analyzing lecturers, which lecturers really engaged me, excited me, the kind of traits they had, which ones, although they had all the accolades and letters next to their name, which one just bored me. I never wanted to be someone who was going to be boring. I always went like engaging. Like I always paid real attention to Raj Ratan's lectures or, or, or stories. Such a amazing storyteller. So that becomes a very important part of me, you know, trying to make it through as an educator. So that was important. And funnily enough, I can go back his first year of dental school, where my buddy Eric, who was a dentist or a dentist student from Korea, and he failed his first year exams. And he said to me, Jazz, if you can help me pass my first year exams, I'll take you to Korea, all expenses paid, right? So I stayed back with him two weeks. I tutored him. We got him to pass. But finally, let's bring it back now to this episode, episode 66, which is on the philosophies of functional occlusion. This is with one of my mentors, Riaz Yar. I'm so excited to share this with you because Riaz inspired me eight years ago to follow along this path of questioning about inclusion and including. It was actually Riaz. I think if I pinpointed it, it was him who really set me on my path. He's such a phenomenal educator. So I know you will love and really resonate with the content he has to share. The kind of things we're talking about today is that canine guidance is overrated. And actually what he suggests is about all about functional occlusion, which is really about the central incisors and first molars, which is going to just blow your mind. I know it is. Before we dive in though, the protrusive dental pearl, how could I forget? I would never do this to you. Uh, the protrusive dental pearl I have for you is a quote. I want to share a quote with you from John Coyce, uh, who I'm sure we all know who listen to this podcast. But if you don't know who John Coyce is, he's kind of a big deal in dentistry. He is this awesome dentist based in Seattle. They've got the Coyce Center. And the quote I want to leave you with is, is, is a beautiful quote. It is, there is no joy in mediocre dentistry. There is no joy in mediocre dentistry. Like, why do we do what we do? Why do we go the extra mile? Why are you listening to me right now? Right? Why, why is this happening? It's because you want to go the extra mile. You don't want to settle for mediocre because this is not fun, right? When you are not, I mean, it's, it sort of links back to last episode where we talked about mindfulness. And if when you're doing your dentistry, if you're uh, doing back-to-back -back class two restorations, for example, and your mind is wondering, it's, it's not in the room, it's not present in the room, you're not giving the patient the best and you're not in a state of flow and you're not involved in the minutiae of the details, which if we can fall in love with those details, it just adds to our enjoyment and fulfillment as a dentist. So uh, that quote uh, by John Coyce, there is no joy in mediocre dentistry. I think that is what it's all about. That's why you listen to this podcast because we don't want to settle for mediocre, right? So thanks for listening to my long introduction today. I do apologize. I want to rush right in now with Riaz Yar, one of the best educators I know. Enjoy. Riaz, Riaz Yar, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm fine. Thank you, buddy. I'm great. Just, uh, yeah, thank you for the invite. Uh, excited to do it. I've seen you've had some really great people on here. So uh, thank you for the invite. No, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're someone who really set me on the path for, for enjoyment of the topic of uh, occlusion. Uh, you may not remember this, but it was 2013. Uh, and I think our first or second study club was with you in London. And I'll never forget the the first one minute of your lecture. And I don't know if you still do this, and you have to tell me if you still do this, but uh, do you remember what you did in the first minute of the lecture? I have no idea, I can't remember, to be honest. Okay, the first minute of the lecture, you just stood up in the middle, okay, and you played a song, and you just got everyone to listen to the song for about 60 seconds, or thereabouts, and then you, you sort of justified it saying that, this, this, this song reminds you of university, and it pumps you up, and it was some heavy metal song. Do you still do that? <laughs> Yeah, it's my dream and plan. It's my dream and planning one. It's uh oh, it's um uh I've, I've got the song. It's, 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 it's still on the lecture. Is it Metallica? Is it Metallica? No, 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 no. It's uh yeah. it's Freedom by um uh oh God, what's the but not Bob Marley? Um, <laughs> but it's, it's Freedom anyway. It's, it, but it's, it's like heavy rock, metal. right? Was that heavy metal? I remember. I remember heavy no, metal. No, no, no. It's it's actually not rock at all. It's actually it's um. It's a very much. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get it here. It's it's it's. it's it was the, the album was Rage Against the Machine. Oh, uh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay, fine, fine. Right. Well, I remember you playing the song, and I was like, wow, that's so unique and so different. So I'll, I'll never forget that lecture for, for for that reason, but but also because of the impact you had in that lecture. I mean, that was, I believe, on the topic of TMD and occlusion at that time, and you made us realize how little 
we knew the anatomy of the temporomandibular joint that year, uh, you know, straight, fresh out of dental school, and no one was confident in the anatomy. And you really brought that home. Uh, and then you really you played with our minds, Raz. You really, you know, made us think hard about occlusion. So I, I never forgot, forgot you, and I've been privileged to be able to be some of your lectures. So uh, it's a testament to you as an educator, and it's fantastic to have you on for that reason. Oh, thank you. Do you want to, you want to listen to Rage Against the Machine again, don't you? I think. <laughs> okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, fine. Perfect. Uh, that, is that Bomb Patrol? What's the song name? Did you get it? Rage Against the uh, Freedom. Freedom. Okay, freedom. Okay, there we are then. So, so everyone, you, you know, you know Riaz's uh, sort of a uh, treatment planning song. So, so that's playing in the background as you're treatment planning. Yeah, so basically that was because with, with dental school, you know, literally when we left dental school, it was that moment of freedom. You know, we literally were like, okay, shackles of dental school are done. You know, I don't need to pick up a book again. You know, it was like literally, I mean, I, that's how I felt. I literally was like, I am not touching a book again. Now it's just to practice. And you realized very quickly that how little you knew. Uh, and yes. Yeah. So you just sort of and, 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 you know, looking at you, you, you did a specialty program in, in prosthodontics, right? So you did some special training in pros? Yes, yes. Uh, so did, uh, I sort of, I was going to do max fax initially. So the, my, my plan was max fax when I qualified. And I, I was working as an anatomy demonstrator while I was working in practice as well. So I was working at Sheffield doing anatomy and I thought max fax, that's it. And then uh, I got married and uh, and then that changed that idea because it was like, well, literally, I'm not going to see the family <laughs> if I do max fax. Uh, and so then I thought, well, you know, what? I'll just do dent. I'll just do general dentistry which is fine you know uh so I bought a practice in 2003 uh nhs practice uh but i think one thing that frustrates uh my mother the most is i can't sit still you know literally you know i'll buy a practice i'll do something and then i'm bored and then she'll be like you just oh you get bored so easily <laughs> so I, literally i think i did it for two or three years and i was bored i was like okay well, what am i doing next uh and so what happened was i joined i did paul tipton's course uh, okay cool and, yeah and paul tipton he doesn't realize it but he you know and this is not a it's not actually a criticism of it he made me realize that was not the way i wanted to learn mm-hmm. so I, I i sort of i did his course and I, you know i thanked him for it because i thanked him for the fact that actually that wasn't the way I wanted to do my dentistry anymore, as in learning-wise, not about mm-hmm. his work or what he does. It just wasn't the way I wanted to learn, doing courses mm-hmm. here and there. So I wanted a structured pathway, so then I, I, I sort of worked my way to getting onto the training program, and that was it, really. And then it didn't stop because you're always doing extra things. And, and recently I saw something pretty spectacular. You did uh, Professor Zucchelli's, uh, like very coveted, very privileged soft tissue program. Is that right? Yeah, his master's. Uh, I, I saw Zucchelli lecture at the EAED, the European Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. And he, he comes on. And just before him, there was a lecturer who talked about bone augmentation and... Um, you know, GB on all to do with implants. So this little Italian guy comes on and he, he's not he's not tall, but he's man is he fiery. And he comes on and he is just like an angry man. <laughs> and <laughs> just, he, he started giving his lecture. And then every sort of every sort of five or ten minutes, he'd just stop and go, it's not about the bone, it's about the soft tissue volume. And that <laughs> I that used to crack me up. And I, and I just thought, that is who I wanted to learn from. And literally, his last slide was, we've decided to run a master's. And I went, that's it. So I took the details down, emailed straight away. They said, you know, nothing's happening for until six months after or so. But you have to go through quite a stringent sort of process because it's in, it's in Bologna. You got to submit all your qualifications and all these sort of things. And it, it takes a while. But anyway, I, I was the only pros guy on there because everyone mm. else was there, which was, which was good. It was interesting. Uh, because you know, I found it important. Uh, I mean, massive uh, kudos to you. I mean, to, to, to me, Riaz, you, you, I look up to you so much, and I feel, I look at you and I, and I think, wow, man, you don't have anything else left to learn. Yet you can start this soft tissue program uh, that just shows your passion, dedication, and your love for dentistry. I know, I'm, I know how much, how passionate you are about it, and definitely it's very infectious. But I think that's what it shows, right? Your a, you can't sit still, like your mother said, uh, and 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 b, that you know your passion and drive is so strong that you want to uh, take on a whole not a completely different field because it's so relevant to what we do, but that's really um, admirable, I think. 
Yeah, no, thank you. I think it, I, I, I've always learned that way. So I prefer to, to be tested and I'm sort of stretched to, to learn a topic. Um, and yeah, no, it was, it was brilliant. It's one of the best things I did. I, it made me realize I probably would never do my training in the UK again if I, if I had to redo, if I was going back, you know, through my career. Yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would go to Bognor Regis and do my training. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I'd go states. I, I would go uh, abroad and do my training abroad. Because uh, if, if you're going to commit to something, I think you should go to the best possible place to to learn. Uh, states, Zurich, so obviously Swiss. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, even Italy's quite good at the moment. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it here personally. I, 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 you know, I, I was very close to actually uh, considering states um, myself, uh, and I, I got the same advice from Jason Smithson uh, around about four years ago when I asked him, and he said the same. You know, consider doing a perio prosa prog uh, program in the states or something like that. And, and a few people say that, so you know, I, I respect that, and it's, it's 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 some good information for young dentists listening out there to to consider. Um, I do have an episode out there. I think it's episode three about um, or, or two about moving to USA. Uh, we follow a, a young lady who's moved to USA to convert her uh, BDS to a U US one. Uh, and then, you know, the world's her oyster from there. So you can check that episode out. But today's episode is all about functional occlusion. And Riaz, I want to start off by asking you, what do you mean by functional occlusion? And I'm just going to um, drag out the question a little bit because you're the one who taught me that the role of, uh, of, sort of, the, the role of teeth is a, or the role of it, you know, in general, is mastication uh, in, in speech and in swallowing, okay? Uh, and then now you're sort of the term functional occlusion. So how does that come into it? Um, so it is a focus on those three roles. Uh, you know, when you think about what you do clinically, you know, you ask your patient to tap the teeth together. You ask the patient to slide their teeth together. You know, why, you know, the question always is, well, well, why are you doing that? You know, what's the point of those steps? So when you ask them to tap the teeth together, that's the swallowing position. Absolutely. So that's what's tapping it. And then when you're looking at functional movements, you're looking at mastication movements. Uh, so you've got to then understand how the mandible works because that actually is what teeth are designed to do. And then when you get that wrong, then problems start to occur. Now, straight away, Riaz, I want to stop because you taught me that our teeth should only touch together for 17 and a half minutes a day. And I remember you're the one who, the first person who taught me that, and it was a graph study in 1964 uh, or 63, and you, you're the one who set me off on that track, and I started looking deep into it. So the, my, now my thinking is, please, now I want to learn from you to correct me if I'm wrong, but now my thinking is those movements that we get them to do, they are not functional, they are parafunctional. So, so how do you, you're probably going to go into this, but how do you then decide whether it is functional or power functional. Uh, so if it's power functional, you'll see signs that it's power functional. So functional movements, I think, you know, when I said that 17 and a half minutes, the, the, the follow on point from that was, what does that tell you about teeth? Well, that tells you that teeth are only really designed to touch for that length of time. Now, let's even elongate it and say, let's say it's 20 minutes or 25 minutes, because that's really, you know, that's only one study that looked at it in depth. Uh, so then when you look at that, you go, fine, that's, but then power function is simply the extension of that. So function, low forces, less time, power function, more forces, more time. So when you have those factors, we know teeth aren't designed to handle that. So then you're going to get problems with the teeth. It's either going to be fracture, whir, mobility, migration, mastic mus muscle issues if they're you know, uh, power functioning tmj issues you know they're they're all the factors sleep issues you know if you look at sleep apnea and power function uh, postural issues depending on tricentric relation if that's you know a philosophy you want to expand into uh so the the, the impact of teeth isn't just this small little box that we're designed to teach it's far greater on the overall health. So when you look at functional occlusion, we have to look at also what the impact is of functional occlusion. Because if you break your food down properly, you then digest your food better. 
your health is better, your sleep is better if you are doing the thing that the teeth are designed to do. So it's related to the mouth, it's isolated to the overall health of the patient. How can you make that clinically applicable? I mean, is it just the same stuff we were taught at dental school? Uh, well, you know, that two-hour lecture that we had on inclusion at dental school where, uh, you know, we have our definitions which are confusing enough and then obviously you want to try and get uh, the concepts of anterior guidance or the minimal stress dentition. Is there anything that, when you're talking about functional inclusion, is there anything that you think was, was skipped or missed at dental school that you'd like to, uh, some key points you'd like to bring home during our short chat now? Uh, I think it's it's teaching philosophies on inclusion is the biggest problem because we're taught canine guidance, for example. So, you know, you're taught canine guidance at dental school and you're taught that that is uh, physiologically correct occlusion. So when someone moves their jaw to the right and the canines take the guidance and disclude the posteriors, that is actually functionally and physiologically correct. And you have to then go back a step and you say, okay, you want to uh, deliver canine guidance for your patients when you restore them. Why, why would you do that, number one? Number two, who told you that and what is it based upon? Because it's like building a house. If you're going to build the foundations on that house so if you're using count canine guidance as your house what are the actual underlying pillars that support canine guidance so if you then read diamico's work he published it in 1958 and then he had the subsequent papers in 1962 and he said you know his 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 rationale behind canine guidance was to refute the balanced articulation score which was what that was going on at that time you know, everyone was giving complete dental occlusion when they were rehabilitating the patients, and then there was numerous issues with it. So he said, no, that's not true. It should be canine guidance. And he looked at Dr. Gregory's work, Hector Jones' work. Uh, Dr. Gregory was the one that did his studies on Aborigines, and they showed the wear of the canines. So it was like, yes, you've lost your canines. It's like, well, no. First, his, um, his understanding of the anthropological data was not quite right because he'd only looked at a certain number and not looked at a greater range and canines are important teeth when it comes to function but it's not the establishing tooth of functional occlusion the two teeth that establish functional occlusion are your central incisors and your first molars so if you think about it then you go okay well why why is that the case well mm -hmm. the reason that's the case is they're the two teeth that erupt first right so if you look at biology biology and physiology tells you what which teeth are the most important teeth when it comes to function it's incisors and your first molars you don't see hyperdonture of first molars or central incisors that often. Mm -hmm. You do see a lot of palately packed canines. So if 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 a if function is designed is is dictated by the canine, then the poor child is is not chewing properly from the age of six to thirteen. So mm -hmm. functional mm -hmm. occlusion is based around the principles of your first molar and your central incisor. And canines really guidance, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because canine guidance is part of your functional guidance. But when you go to canine guidance, you go beyond the envelope of function. So then what is the envelope of function? Well, the envelope of function is a three millimeter lateral movement in which you break your food down. You go beyond three millimeters, that's then parafunction. That's mm -hmm. a habit-based movement, not a functional movement. And that's when you get whir of canines. And I used to always make me laugh when someone said, yeah, you know, warn canines, give them canine guidance because it switches the muscles off. No, <laughs> you warn the canines, you're going to wear, wear there's a composite, you're going to wear the zirconia. Past is prologue, it will happen again. Mm -hmm. It will happen again because it's not the canine guidance. You actually want group function in those patients because you want to share the loads amongst all the restorations. So especially oblique, because you know materials are very good at compressive loads, swallowing loads, but not great at uh, lateral or oblique loads. 
One thing I just want to pause you there, Riaz, and talk about a common error I see or, or, or people talk about is sometimes people uh, message me and say, uh, for, for advice, they say, hey, I've got this patient and they've lost canine guidance and I'm thinking of adding some canine rises. But what's happening is that they're, they're choosing these cases whereby if they add these canine rises, then as soon as the per, per patient then goes into excursive again, there's so much tensile load on that composite, it's just going to break off, and there's no surprise mm-hmm. when, when, when it fails. And you made, you mentioned a, gr- a great point, which I want to highlight, because otherwise, in, in passing, you could miss it, is about those oblique. So in, in those cases, would you agree that perhaps if you were going to go down that path, you may then, and this is going to be the rest of the podcast, we talk about raising the OVD, but you, have to, you may have to consider raising the OVD or some orthodontics to be able to turn that load into compressive load Am I going along the right path, you think? Yeah, OVD increases based on overbite and overjet. So your decision for OVD should always be analysed as part of an overjet overbite analysis. And I think that's where the biggest problem is. Because people think, yeah, I need OVD to create space for the restorations. That is true. But when you increase the OVD, you reduce the overbite. So if you reduce the overbite, you need to then make sure that your posteriors disclude the anterior, certainly the, the incisors, disclude the posteriors. So if you then get the curve, then you have to make the curve of speed flatter if you reduce the overbite. So these are all things that we don't realize we're doing when we think about OVD. Everyone just thinks increase OVD, it's easy as that. But when you increase the OVD, think of it like a clock. Mm-hmm. So... You are at nine o'clock. And if you increase the OVD, meaning you go from nine to six, what happens to the the line, the curve? You go from nine to six, you increase the OVD, but you also increase the overjet. Mm -hmm. That means you've got to put material somewhere. It's going to be either on the palatal aspect of the uppers and the labial aspect of the lower incisors. So, yes, OVD is an option to give you bulk of material and change the angles and and give, but it still won't protect against oblique forces because oblique mm-hmm. materials in bulk are still great with compressive, but oblique forces they're not great at. But by oblique, do you also is it aka tensile uh, stress? Is that a, a good? Yeah. Okay. Fine. I'm with oblique, you. Oblique, I'm oblique, with you. oblique means tension, so you basically put more tension on the restorations, and therefore they're more likely to fracture or. If they're stronger than the the underlying core, then the core will break. You know, that's sort of the, 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 it's a balance. Um, Someone has to win when it comes Mm -hmm. to the force. Uh, So, yeah, I think with OVD, you increase to give you more material. So you bond onto debt to enamel. That's the ideal. So you're going, I'm going to increase because I can bond to enamel. Therefore, greater bonding strength, greater uh, management of forces. Uh, but you, it's the key guy. The key decisioning decision factor is your overbite, overjet, and your smile, mm-hmm. because when you increase the OVD, the obviously overbite is reduced. Then you need to increase the length of the upper incisors so the patient shows more teeth. But if they're already showing the right amount of tooth, you've got to then take the gum off. So this is you know for OVD, I, you know I give an advanced two-day advance course on sort of looking at in detail OVD and how you analyze. Because the problem you have with occlusion is you use an articulator. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. So you sort of whatever the reason why we do canine guidance and we can't do functional occlusion is because the lateral movements on an articulator are nothing like the lateral movements on the human. And the reason for that is if you just even go back to the basics of the articulator, if you just look at the ball and and joint of the articulator, first the, the, the ball is circular and the, the, the fossa is angular. Uh, when you look at a, a CBCT of your condyles, they look like potatoes. They don't look like balls. Uh, the glenoid fossa is not uh, a perfect rectangle uh so it, it, it you know you can buy foster inserts but you know the anatomy of uh the tmj joint is is variable riaz you just reminded me of um, episode uh, 30 and 31 i did with someone called uh, dr andy toy i don't know if you've come across the the pgo the posterior guided occlusion theory posterior guided occlusion theory you meaning using the molars to guide the occlusion in 
Uh, yes, but also uh, there's an equation um, that, that Andy Tor and his, and his team, Ron Presswood, found whereby they did some anthropological studies and they found that, that um, Zola's, t Zola's t tubercle uh, around the glenoid fossa and the angle that produces, just like you said, the, you know, the reason that can't be produced uh, into an articulate because it's too complex, but they, they found that the, that angle is, is the same angle as w w where the molars are at. Um, so that was an interesting two episodes about how Canine guidance is, is is not the end goal, and it shouldn't be. And really, uh, he talks about the PGO model. And if you haven't checked that out, Riaz, I'd love uh, to to send you that yeah, to, to check out because I know you you love this sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. But I was just wondering if you'd come across Andy Toy before and, and the, the posterior guided occlusion I've, model. I've, I've heard of I've heard of Andy Toy. I've not I've not heard of that terminology. I mean, I, we call it functional occlusion because the dictating tooth is the first molar. So mm -hmm. getting that you know, distal buccal cusp of the upper molar, for example, right, and getting the curve of speed right and getting your curve of Wilson right means you can design functionally indirect restorations. Because one of the biggest challenges I think dentists have are rebuilding first molars because it's it's the first tooth that is exposed and therefore first tooth that decays and first tooth that needs endo and first tooth that... And it's always that first tooth that needs the most work. Uh, and then, you know, most commonly people will talk to me about, uh, you know, the, 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 the onlays always look really flat and don't have the right shape. I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've, you've seen what we've done. Uh, do you know Nick Setti? Yes, I know Nick very well, and I've seen, seen some of the stuff you've done. And uh, the, do you, I mean, do you want to talk about FIPO or is that for another time or? That's for another time. I think it just, that, that was sort of the, 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 the whole idea behind FIPO was that we do, um, we do a lot of our restorations, but we're not looking at the true morphology and shape of teeth. And to try and design functionally uh, driven restorations simply, you know, with a simple protocol uh, is what people really struggle with. And so we've, that's what the FIPA protocol is. Uh, but that's just one of the principles that leads into, you know, you get the first molar right, everything else is pretty straightforward. You know, once you have that guidance of the six in, then the five, the four, the three are coming at that cuspal inclination. And that's what, that's what Mod Jaws helped. It's helped me analyze more what I'm doing and, you know, see whether we are, you know, ultimately rehabilitating the patient, not just restoring them. For those, for those listeners who, who haven't heard of Modjo, because uh, young dentists listen to this and they may not have come across Modjo, and I love your sort of uh, uh, postings that you do in your videos of showing people's chewing patterns and whatnot. But can you just uh, explain to those who haven't heard of Modjo before what it is and why it's so awesome? Uh, so we'll look, this is the first, well, it's not the first time, that's not strictly true, but it's, it's probably the best technology we've had to date where we actually use the human as the articulator. And how it works is it uses similar sensors that uh, Pixar anim uh, animation use, you know, to replicate human movements in their cartoons. So this is what we're doing with that. So this is using a, a camera, infrared uh, technology and using sensors on the patient. And what this is doing now is we're actually looking at the data of the patient as the true articulator. And so this is using what, what's called 4D. Uh, technology. So we've gone from 2D, 3D, we're now into 4D. Uh, and it is, it is pretty amazing. And, and the data that gives you is just amazing. And it helps you to be a, a more functional dentist, I guess, to actually, can, you know, giving the patient the best function. But the, the questions that are in my mind now is, how can you make this actually tangible in term? In, I mean, it's very difficult, it's such a broad topic. But most people have been throughout dental school, and they come out thinking that, Yes, canine guidance is what it's all about, and it, and it makes sense to some degree. It's furthest away from the TMJ hinge. Uh, I remember you taught me the importance of uh, uh, canine guidance for those reasons, but also mostly due to restorative con convenience and how easy it is for technicians to build that in and whatnot. But mm -hmm. what are you saying now? Are you saying that you want the sixes to have some guidance? Can you just make it a bit more tangible, the point about functional occlusion, how it relates to sixes and ones, and... And what is it that you're actually looking for in terms of the dots and lines? So what you're looking for is what are called your trajectory movements of your functional guidance in. So we call this cycle in and cycle out. So what me, what that means is when the patient is coming in to for the teeth to touch, that's called cycle in. And that would be guided off the platal inclines of the upper buccal cusps against the lower buccal cusps, the lower supporting cusps. So that's what is guided in. Now, the guiding in is what 
is the data for the brain. But it's the guiding out, there's what's called the cycle out, which is now the actual guidance against the palatal cusp of the upper, is what breaks the food down. So this movement, and it looks like a peer, uh, the, the classic de description was it was a peer drop. And it's not, I don't think it's sick, strictly like that. It, it is certainly what I'm seeing data-wise is that we are getting a certainly an oval shape. Now, what we're looking at is two movements. We're looking at the opening movement and then the lateral movement and then the closing movement in. Now, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm looking at patients before I restore them, provisional restorations, and then my definitive restoration. So I'm looking at the chewing movements in three stages. And I'm answering the question whether I'm making things worse or better. Now, patients don't recognize the, the, the re restriction in chewing because they adapt. And if a patient has good adaptive capacity, they will say nothing to you. They'll come in with your beautiful restorations and they'll tell you everything is okay. And that is, that is right in their mind because functionally they have adapted to what you've given them. But if you were to actually look at their chewing motion data, because remember, teeth are designed to break food down, you would probably find that their chewing cycle has narrowed and become more vertical, meaning that they're still chewing, but the lateral component to protect themselves from breaking your work or because of the design of the teeth, they're, 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 they've guarded themselves, so their movements are guarded, their functional movement is narrowed. Mm -hmm. And I, I can show you a picture of, of a case which we did and where I did the, the pre-treatment. And I know people won't see this, but I think it helps to sort of, uh, if those that do see it, then it can sort yeah. of... Yeah, uh, there's, there's yeah. those who watch it on, on, on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube and whatnot, so we can almost yeah. describe it. But one, I mean, as you're loading it up and as you're about to share your screen, uh, you, I, I believe it was a Lundin and Gibbs study whereby they had people um, in these sort of you know, let's let's call them cows. You know, like uh, side side chewers, for example. Uh, and then um, after rehabilitation, they became vertical chewers. And I believe that was seen as a good thing. Are you suggesting that's not a good thing? Yeah, I'm definitely not. I think if you look at this sort of case here that we did, uh, I mean, this is sort of this is the starting position of the case. So just to give you an idea of where she was at, that's the starting position. She's got a bridge from yep. the upper right four to the upper right six and the fours <laughs> failed the three is in the position of the two so that's actually a three a canine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and if you look at the sort of the design of the teeth before just look at the shape of those cuspal inclinations they're very yeah. flat very flat and yeah. That's because, yeah that's because we use an articulator okay mm -hmm. so that's that's a type of design depending on whether your average value is set so that's just the mod jaw so what i did was I did a pre-position. So if you look, if you actually analyze the data on this, you'll see that the width of the pre-position uh, uh, is four millimeters width at the bottom, okay? So each square is one millimeter. Okay. Okay? So if you look at the arrow, four squares, so her width of lateral movement is four millimeters. Yeah. If you look at what I did, and I put it into a provisional first, and her width increased on chewing on the right to seven millimeters. And then in a final, her width moved to around 10 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Now this is at the bottom. So that's, that's actually when she opens and moves laterally. So what does that tell us? Does that tell us now that her muscles are more relaxed? Does that tell us that actually she's more comfortable moving? But the next slide is what really sort of hits home this. Because if you look at the cycle in, now the, 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 the vertical movement when they're coming into the teeth touching, okay, that's where those lines are. So this is now where teeth are touching. So when she started, she was two millimeter lateral movement when she comes into chewing her food. So, so the red is cycle in, green is cycle out. But look what happened in the provisionals. She actually had the same two millimeter width, but can you see the trajectory? It yeah, narrowed, mm -hmm. it became steeper. So why was that? That was potentially her way of guarding. She was going, actually, I know my bridge is provisional. Mm -hmm. 
So I, when I chew, I narrow my chewing cycle. So actually, I, I don't put too much force on an oblique angle. And then look what happened when we put her into a final. Mm -hmm, look mm -hmm. at the width and the trajectory totally changed. So she's gone from a two millimeter functional movement. And that's because I've corrected the angles. If you look at the sort of the shape of the teeth, but that's sort of, that's where she's at now. But if you look at the shape of the, 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 the teeth on the right, look at the, the way they're uh, positioned mm -hmm. uh, to be totally, you know, functional. Uh, and so her chewing has improved. You know, that, that is our role. Our role is to improve the situation, uh, improve the functionality. That's very fascinating. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at this sort of case as well, I mean, this is these are the angles of, of the cusps on, on, on mod jaw. You know, this is, this is what functional teeth should look like. You know, they, they mm -hmm. should have steeper angles, steeper, th and that's because the teeth are designed to break down. You know, morphology is actually like this. You know, whereas when I look at what, what we used to do, this is before... Um, uh, before I had mod jaw, so these are cases that I did before mod jaw. If you look at this case here, you know before, look at the so this look is look on at the right the, side, yeah. On the right side is what you would do before mod jaw. No, these are these are both mod jaw left and right. But if you looked at the next this case here where I did without, this is what I used to do. Look at the, this is on an average value articulator. You know, look uh, if you look at what I did. Also, I did this with a case. I did a case where I made two sets of restorations. So on the mm -hmm. posterior so i did you know if you look at that if you look at the cuspal angles on the average value and what i did here was i sent it to two different labs in two different countries so the right module was done in france and the left side the average value was done in the uk all using my digital scan data but one was done using motion data and one was done using average value settings on, on the digital articulator. So look at the cuspal inclinations of, of functional data. Can you see how the palatal inclines and the buccal inclines are the same when you have functional data? But when you don't have functional data, look at the different angles. It's sort of, you know, different shapes. There's no thought to functionality. Whereas when you do restorations that are functional, look at the similarity in the shapes that are created. You know, this is a bridge. So this right one was made on mod jaw. The left one was made from average values. These are all cycling angulations. If you use an average value, the cycling angulations are all obscure. But if you use motion data, you have very similar cycling pathways because that's what teeth are They're designed to be functional and break, teeth, uh, break your food down. Riaz, I'm smiling because you're, you're doing it again. You're doing that thing that you did to me in 2013. You're making me think, like you make me like rethink everything. <laughs> you, know, you, know when I, you know when the penny dropped? Honestly, it was like it was like an epiphany moment. And literally, it took me, it probably took me six months of to stop kicking myself because for six months after the penny dropped and the jigsaw, everything just fitted together. I start. I was kicking myself solidly for six months. Even now, when I think about it, I get irritated with myself. Because why I got irritated with myself is because I I blindly believed what I was taught, and I never questioned it. And I should have questioned it from the very outset. You know, when someone said canine guidance to me, you know, and they gave me the rationale, I should have still gone, why, 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 or well, why, 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 you know. And uh, you know, I, I want to use this opportunity to thank my mentor because for me, the guy who really planted the seed on functional occlusion was a, a French guy called Marcel Legal. Uh, and he passed away on the 2nd of July. Uh, and he was that. very dear to me. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's credit to him that he sort of, you know, literally blew my mind, you know, literally shattered everything that I had read up until that date and just, mm -hmm. you know, made me think, you know, you know, and and every ever ever since then, you know, I was like, canine guidance. Why? It's crazy to even think that one tooth is going to function and guide you in 
It's just, it doesn't even make sense now that I say it. Well, I, I, I spot on, and I agree with you, and I, I definitely see the world, and again, my world has been shaped by you as well uh, in the past. So I, I definitely agree with you that canine, canine guidance is not the be-all and end-all, and most of our patients in the natural dentition don't have it to, to begin with. Uh, it, 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 would you agree with that statement? Uh, no, I think they, they have canine guidance, but it's beyond an, a beyond a natural movement. You see, I have canine guidance on my right, but I have to go to an excursive movement that is not is not functional. It is a parafunctional movement, or it's a habit based movement. Yeah. So when you do canine guidance, you don't chew like that. Mm -hmm. You don't of chew course. off your canine to guide you in. Okay, brilliant. So, so yeah, I mean, but, but one thing again, I'll reference back to the the PGO episode uh, is that one of the the theories because now we're just getting to philosophies and theories, which is quite uh, yeah. interesting actually. Is that if you were to um, observe canine guidance, and you know, we do this all the time. You get, your patients are pine. Oh, Mr. Smith, can you please grind to your right half time. They don't know what they're doing, but w when they do figure it out, you can see. Ah, yes, the canines are touching and the postures are discluding, and you may say, okay, that's canine guidance. But when you actually get them to do it with some force you'll suddenly see all the, the back teeth uh, involved in that guidance movement as well. So the, the theories suggest that actually how many people are really in canine guidance at full force, which is really what you're doing uh, in a parafunctional uh, movement, uh, perhaps nocturnally. And, and what the PGO model will suggest that actually very few people are in canine guidance because when you actually do a healthy clench or when you actually put some force into it, you compress the PDL and you seat your condyle perhaps a little bit and then suddenly the sevens and the sixes and the premolars come in. Uh, I'd love to hear your view or, or the, the, that take on that. You know, forces in functional movement are low unless mm. your food is hard. So functional forces are low. You know, if you use Larson's paper, you know, you're looking at 40 newtons, which is which is 80 Snickers bars. You know, so the force of 80 Snickers bars or the weight of 80 Snickers bars is not actually that heavy. So, you know, and that's if you're going to choose something a bit hard. You know, something that needs a bit more force. That's why the incisors are so important because the number of periodontal mechanoreceptors in the anterior teeth are more than the posterior teeth because you grab the food and that data to the brain tells you how much force you need to apply on your posterior teeth. It's why you know not to chew soup. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't think about it. You just, you just put it in your mouth. You know it's liquid. You don't chew it. You swallow it. Mm -hmm. If you have a bit of crouton in it, you know straight away whether there's a bit of hard crouton or soft. So this data is, is part of, of functional data. So functional forces are low. Mm -hmm. What they're talking Agreed. about when they're talking about clenching forces and uh, other yes you, you, when you pl apply force, you increase elevator muscle activity. And so the, ref the, the, the rationale behind canine guidance was because it, canine, disc, uh, canine guidance separated the posterior teeth and therefore switched off elevator muscle activity. But for functional occlusion, you want muscle uh, elevator activity. You want it because you're breaking your food down. You don't yep. want to be switching off your muscles because that's the teeth. That's what that's what that, that's what they are. That's what the PGO camp argues well. Like actually, you want the muscles on. You don't want them off, which is which is an agreement with you uh, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, to, to, I mean, there's so many directions we can go in this episode. But really, this is a, an introduction for us to functional inclusion. Uh, one thing I want to ask to make it tangible is: Can we make functionally correct restorations without module? Uh, that's question A. And the B part of that is. Can we just achieve that if we're conforming by following the cuspal inclines of the adjacent teeth? Would that do the, a good job? Yes, if, if, the, if the adjacent teeth, looking at the mouth is going to help make a lot of your decisions for you. So, for example, using the FIPO protocol, for example, like a lower six you're restoring. But the upper six is, is, an, is a natural tooth. It's fine. So what I do is I just basically a bit of self etch primer uh, on the tooth and I put a small bit of composite on there, and I get the patient to bite into that composite and light cure it. When they, when they open, you then have the cuspal inclines of the palatal cusp in there. That is your data. You can adjust it a little bit to get the right inclination, but there straight away, you have your anatomy of your restoration. So you don't need module to do functional restorations. You can do it quite quickly with a bit of self fetch prime and a small amount of composite. That's if you're doing single or uh, two or three restorations. 
When you're starting to do a quadrant of dentistry, then you need to look at, obviously, functionally guided pathway techniques. So, for example, jaw relay, asking the patient to chew, but not getting them to grind their teeth, but actually getting them to chew and get the data the other way around. You can then do it without module, but then the technician will struggle because he's then putting the data on an articulator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, dish, the, the challenge is not you, we can do it ourselves, but the challenge is when you then give it to the laboratory. Now, if you've got digital, you can potentially scan that and then they can use a digital software to then design the restorations using those inclinations. But even on digital, they're using digital articulators set at average value settings. Because with digital articulators, you're not populating it with a protrusive bite. You're not populating it with psychat function, for example, or, uh, or zebras. These are other devices, Dean Arcadiacs. These are other digital tools that give you values to populate an articulator. So the module, you know, it's, it's, it's for me because I've got a lot of questions that I need to answer. And some of the questions I'm starting to answer in my own head, you know, am I... Am I rehabilitating the patient? Am I making their function better? And, you know, part of that assessment is obviously a muscle assessment, a TMJ assessment. Uh, and, and, and I think to be able to do good quality dentistry, you don't need expensive tools. You have to just first be able to understand the basics well. That's a good start. And then you realize that the tools will make you a better to, will, will make you understand more and therefore perform better and then you you, you know you will end up investing because you invest in your career so i think a module is i think module will be i think that is potentially going to be one of the most essential tools we're going to have if you're doing rehabilitative dentistry you know doing multiple but if you're doing general single arch single tooth dentistry then clearly no you don't need it even multiple units here and there you could design the teeth just looking at the morphology of the opposing arch and correcting it with composite. Brilliant. That's what I... I'm just very mindful of time. I'm going to throw some quick fire questions at you, Riaz, because uh, it's taken a very interest. I've really enjoyed your uh, uh, almost philosophical debate, and there's been some parallels to the PGO concept, which I'm definitely going to send you away because I'd love to yeah. have your uh, input on that. But the, the, the kind of questions I have now, based on everything you said, is Frank Spear said um, in his sort of treatment planning sort of thing, EFSB, so uh, Aesthetics, Function, Structure, Biology. That's his sort of famous uh, sort of treatment planning sort of uh, acronym, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then Michael Melkus always taught me that, in fact, it's aesthetics, parafunction, structure, biology, because when we're doing a rehab, uh, and this is what the, the canine guidance camp will tell you, is that when you're doing a rehab, you want to set the patient up for to re reduce the, the forces in every way possible. And that's what you uh, sort of alluded to as well, that you know it reduces elevator muscle activity. Uh, and of course, you want to get uh, onto the anteriors as much as possible. Whereas now you're saying uh, the sixes have an important role. So now that you're doing your rehabs uh, in a functional occlusion way, and you're, you're checking the occlusion at the end to make sure it's set up for success. What percentage of your rehabs now have got pure traditional canine guidance uh, and what percentage have group function? Is that a fair question? Just to, to get an idea of what it, the end, end product actually looks like. Yeah, so I think in the last, since I've bought the module, everything has been shifting over to group function. Uh, and prior to 18 months, it was, I was using uh, FGS functionally generated pathways to try and get group function, but it was more difficult to do. It was easier to just exclude and give them a, give them canine guidance uh, because patients adapt. Um, so I think to date now, pretty much every case is a uh, is group function. It's power function. Now I know you know Mike. What Michael said was you know aesthetics power function. You want function first, because for me, if you get function right, function and power function are not too different in their movements. You will have some that do more obscure movements, but you can't prepare your restorations for that. You know, when they have a true habit-based occlusion, you can't prepare your design to protect against that. If they got, for example, if they're moving their jaw to get to that lateral incisor or that canine, that that's a habit. You you know you they will just destroy that that area, and you're just going to be rehabilitating that area. You can't switch off the power functional habit because power functional habits aren't truly occlusion based. 
they are they are much more than that their genetics their their hormones you know Hashimoto patients, chlamydia patients, you know, you can have, so there's, there's a far greater link to power function than just teeth. But that's not to, to I'm not, I, you know, I listen to Manfredini, I'm not uh, that solid to the point where that occlusion is zero TMD. Mm-hmm. I think the small, I think it's a small amount uh, in certain patients, but it's definitely not all of it, you know, it's not like occlusion. And then it's that right. Uh, absolutely. And you're the one who taught me about you know, micro trauma and macro trauma. So I owe a lot to you in terms of uh, my, my learnings with that. Uh, and just to, to wrap up a few more questions that I have, I had a really good one. Yes. Now that you're finishing these cases in group function, and perhaps the, the reason these patients ended up in your chair as a specialist is because they have done weird and wonderful things to a dentition. They have been power function. They have been bruxing. They've worn their teeth away. And now you're built on the functional occlusion, which involves group function. Um, a, are you not worried that they're going to destroy uh, with increased elevated muscle activity uh, all the lovely restorations that you put in? And B, um, does every rehab get a um, appliance for protection? Uh, if the if the underlying cause is also is power functional, then yes. For nighttime, where they will get a protection, they'll get there because that that is something that we can't control. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. So they do get a splint if they've spent that sort of money. How, will they break my restorations? We'll have to do the podcast in a couple of years' time, and I'll I'll tell you <laughs> because at, at the moment they're not. Yeah, but, of course. But you may, you may be absolutely right. In in two years' time, I and I'll be I'll be open enough. You know, I've learned this. You know, with people that have been through with me through my journey, have, will have seen me change my understanding and my teaching to to reflect what I'm learning. And why I'm changing it, why I'm justifying it. Zucchelli was the one that taught me that with you know absolute passion that his position five years ago is different to his position now. But that's because what he's learned and what he's doing. So I'm you know recording these data and I'm doing the modules and I want to know, you know, do do our patients do I mean that bridge may only last two years. Is that because of what I've done? Potentially. Could it be that she bit on something hard or, you know, fell over? You know, it's all these unknowns that we don't have. But certainly, you know, we've got to be reflect, uh, critical of ourselves when we're, when we're looking at our work. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I may come back to you in two, three years' time and go, I'm sorry, Jas, whatever I told you in that podcast, <laughs> delete it. <laughs> uh... because, because, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually more comfortable in my skin now about occlusion than I've ever been. And that, that I'm now more uh, solid on that. Now I, I, I'm happy to stand in front of thousand people and be before I believe I understood it, but I never really had a hundred percent conviction. There was always this niggling doubt in my head and I just couldn't get it out of my head. It took, you know, years and years of reading and reading and reading i just it just never comfortably sat in my head and so there was always this niggling doubt and it always hit me when someone asked me a question you know and the biggest question that always got me was they said yeah but if your canine tips were why would you give them canine guidance again mm-hmm. and I, I i i was always stumped by that question I was like, well at least there were the material away rather than the tooth and I, mm-hmm. that was my answer and i remember even sort of saying it i always felt I didn't say hypocritical, but it just never felt, you know, yes, I did it. I was taught. Robin Gray was one of my mentors who was, you know, fantastic TMD, fantastic dentist. Stephen Davis, one of my mentors, an amazing guy uh, and very knowledgeable. But I I just, it just never sat with me until now. Now I'm, now I'm comfortable in my skin with the occlusion. That is amazing, and I think that, that wraps it up. Uh, Riaz, um, tell me, where can we learn more about um, your way of thinking now? Because uh, there's a lot of people uh, who can have lots of questions in their head. Uh, and, and so, um, I mean, I know you've always been a good educator. You, you've had your year-long programs in the past. Uh, I don't know if you're still doing that. But where is the, for the hungry minds that we have, uh, which reminds you, that's the name of your study club as well, where you, people come and you feed them. That was great, by the way. Uh, <laughs> tell that's us, where can we learn more, Riaz? Up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, there will be some dates coming out. I, I, with with our recent restriction that we were running a two day course in November, that is again tentative now. I don't know if that all that will happen. 
so I think just wait till for next year. The year-long course is starting again in February, but it's it's with um, it's it's going to be a diploma in advanced aesthetics. So that's starting in in, in February. It's going to be me, Nick, uh, and Sanjay who are sort of running that program. So I think that is that in London or. Happen. Yes, it'll be in London and in uh, up north. So it'll be Manchester and London. Brilliant. Please uh, do send me the, a website link so I can stick that on for those who are interested. I will do. No, because part, part of it is, look, I, I bring on lots of educators of various backgrounds uh, and, and some listeners will resonate more with, you know, just like, you know, some will resonate more with certain educators and other educators. So I want to give everyone uh, the, the platform and it'd be great to, to, to have that. So That's check it out, guys. Uh, Riaz has, has uh, blown me away once again and reset that uh, sort of hunger to, to, to learn. So Riaz, thank you so much for giving up your time. And, oh, and maybe I will take you up on that part too, because honestly, I'm looking through my questions that I had and we didn't even get to um, when to just conform and, uh, and reorganize the stuff because it just went a little bit philosophical and I really enjoyed it for that reason. But one day we'll, we might cover that. No, definitely. My pleasure. Thank you, Jas. And well done, by the way. I, I love what you're doing. And this is, this is, you know, it's brilliant. And kudos to you because I think, you know you, you, what you're doing is 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 giving everyone that opportunity to learn you benefit but actually you're sharing it with everyone so uh yeah well done Love it. that's very kind of you thank you so much Raz, for, for for your inspiration really appreciate it thank you so much for listening as always all the way to the end i really appreciate it always i hope you enjoyed and gained value from riaz i think what he's done to advance the studies in inclusion and helping us dentists understand over the years is just amazing and phenomenal it's one of the reasons that why uh, on the splint course one of the first few slides i have on the splint course there's a photo of him as well as many other dentists who inspired me to learn more about occlusion and made me better at delivering splints and maybe question the why the how the when of splints so riaz is definitely in that category of these inspiring dentists that meant a lot to me in my journey. I'll catch you in April, which is straight April, and we're going to talk all about orthodontics over the next month. I hope you enjoy. Reach out to me on at Protrusive Dental, uh, and it'd be great to connect with you all. Uh, enjoy straight April.